as certificate Marty Noxon isn't afraid of the ugly stuff. I'm feeling a little murdery, says Marty Noxon, which sounds not unlike something you'd hear from the mouth of Buffy Summers, the iconic cheerleader turned Hellmouth Avenger. This is not surprising. Given Noxon began her writing career on Buffy the Vampire Slayer back in 1997, come to think of it, when I meet her for breakfast at a hotel in Tribeca, she looks much as I imagine Buffy might, if the character had made it to the age of 52. Though I'd arrived well before our scheduled meeting, I find Noxon, who'd flown in from L.A., late on the previous night, already ensconced in the restaurant, her murdery feelings prompted by her lodging in a claustrophobic room facing a wall. It's kind of like being jailed, she says, but a really nice jail. Like for a white-collar crime. Three or four times this morning, she reports, she'd considered asking for a better room, but she didn't, because she assumed they would say no. And that will be sadder because they probably do have one, she jokes, they just somehow know that I'll settle for less. If the hoteliers were acquainted with her current workload, they'd likely not suspect her of settling. Her first film, To the Bone, which she wrote and directed, about a woman battling anorexia, will begin streaming on Netflix on July 14th. Simultaneously, she's been developing the first show in a seven-figure, three-year deal she signed in 2016 with Skydance Media. AMC's Deetland, based on Sarah Walker's best-selling novel, she's also been finishing up the last season of Bravo's Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce, and filming's begun on her HBO series Sharp Objects, which she's adapting from Gone Girl author Gillian Flynn's debut novel. It feels like in the last five or six years, I've been hitting my stride as the closest Noxon gets to patting herself on the back. She is the waspish tendency to downplay, well, everything. She's also seductive, a disarmingly candid, fun, and open-hearted and staff friend, but not without the inherent boundaries of a woman who has sustained, as she puts it, damage. In some ways, Noxon's first writing job was a tease. Buffy, as run by Joss Hedden, offered Noxon not only an extraordinary creative playpen but also a rare safe place to flourish. In a still more dominated TV universe, the reason I fell in love with Buffy was because of the ambiguity, because she was a superhero and a hot mess. I hadn't seen anything like her on TV, ever, says Noxon. At the same time, for me, there was always the big debate, dating vampires is a bad idea. So let's have some consequences for these choices, it's the only way you learn. Promoted to executive producer in 2001, she helmed the show's controversial sixth season, during which, among other things, Buffy falls into a deep depression and starts acting out after her friends resurrect her from death. It turns out she had been in heaven, not hell. Whoops. Noxon took serious heat from fans, and this was well before social media. For some people, including star Sarah Michelle Gellar, it felt like a betrayal of where we had started, says Noxon. We had said this show is going to be weird, but I don't think we'd said that it's going to be really fucked up. Noxon has a fondness for awkwardness, and a successful character, to her mind, doesn't need to be liked, an attitude uncommon in 2001, particularly when it came to women. The bane of every TV writer's existence is the likability note, she says, though a lot of grief was coming from the show's female fans, unused to seeing a heroine break bad, I suggest to her that in a TV universe that now includes the angry, damaged women of Unreal, which Noxin co-created with Sarah Gertrude Shapiro, Fleabag. And I love Dick, the reaction to season six of Buffy would be entirely different, Noxin agrees, then adds that, furthermore. Every project that I currently have is about women who are deeply, deeply messed up. Noxon's Twitter bio makes comic hay of the backlash, I ruined Buffy and I will ruin you. 2. But it wasn't fun to go through. I hadn't gelled yet as a writer, or found a voice that was unique to me, she says. And I was really afraid that I didn't have the right stuff. I think a lot of my subsequent choices were dictated by that fear. After Buffy. She found herself drifting into mediocre shows, 
and one, 2005's Point Pleasant, seemed to confirm her insecurities. A critic gave it a negative review, and literally Nam checked me, because he'd liked my work on Buffy, she says. I was like, oh, wow, that hurt. It got me to a really good shrink. In 2008, she landed at Mad Men, during its second season, and as part of that writing team won two WGA awards, I point out to her, in reference to creator Matthew Weiner's legendary control freakishness, that at least she got to write. Kind of, says Noxon, with a laugh, that was such an interesting experience. On the one hand, it was like boot camp, going back to the basics of good writing, ambiguity, mystery, scenes that are about taking a breath, not just propelling things forward, so many good things that I needed to relearn. On the other hand, Matt wasn't happy, hardly ever, about anything the writers did. The message from him was, only I can do this. So, the exact opposite of Hden, Joss's genius was oppressive in a different way, she says, he had come back from a weekend having written a musical, never having written music in his life. And you'd be, fuck me. I'm not even going to try, at the same time, every once in a while someone will say to me, how do you do all this? And I think, oh, I'm somebody's Joss now, I went and directed a movie while working on multiple TV shows, somebody out there probably thinks, fuck her. And I think, I've arrived. Noxon is in New York to be honored by Project Heal. an organization that provides grants to subsidize treatments for people with eating disorders. Her film, To the Bone, not so loosely based on Noxon's own story, is about a 20-year-old woman, played by Lily Collins, with life-threatening anorexia, as a high school senior. Noxon weighed 69 pounds, this after years of ineffectual medical treatment, she finally got better thanks to a doctor's than radical therapy. One that stresses emotion rather than weight, Kinu Reeves plays the doctor based on drive. Richard McKenzie, who still practices at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, knocks and found her voice, or, if you want to get Buffy about it, her superpowers, by finally writing about deeply personal subjects. As she began turning her anorexia into a film, she discovered something curious. There were no prominent feature films about the subject, only TV movies. It quickly became clear why. Male studio executives considered the subject of anorexia a disease movie that nobody wanted to see, she says. I had one producer tell me, it's such a small topic. A small topic, throw a rock in your office and you'll hit a woman who is harming herself one way or another. It took three female producers to get to the bone made. Netflix picked it up after its premiere at the Sundance Film Festival in January. A funny sidebar, she tells me of her own story, is that when I was stuck between high school and college, because I was too sick to go, my stepmother heard that Jennifer Jason Lee was doing a TV movie about anorexia and needed a body double. Noxon was hired. But a writer's strike put a halt to production, abruptly ending her career as a professional, anorexic. A particularly striking scene into the bone must have seemed ridiculous on paper. Ellen's mother, played by Lily Taylor, pulls her grown daughter onto her lap and nurses her with a bottle. Most people involved with the film were very nervous about that scene, Noxon admits. And yet, as it plays out, it becomes one of the film's most moving. It really happened she says, and it was as wildly awkward and uncomfortable as it looks in the film. When I ask why she agreed to this extremely flaky therapy, Noxon says, I think I felt like it would be rude to tell my mother that I didn't want to do it. Every project I currently have, says Noxon, is about women who are deeply, deeply messed up. Noxon grew up in L.A., and after her parents split, when she was eight, she and her younger brother, Christopher, who's now married to Genji Cohen, creator of Orange is the New Black, moved between their parents' households. Her father, a documentary filmmaker for National Geographic, remarried a woman with three children. Her mother, 
married twice more, once to a woman, behaved erratically until finally being diagnosed with bipolar well into her 50s. One of the ways that manifested when we were growing up was that all of a sudden the rules would change, sometimes overnight, says Noxon. Now I'm a Buddhist. Now I'm an alcoholic. Now I'm a sober alcoholic. Now I'm not an alcoholic. Now I'm a lesbian. With proper medication, she's still a Buddhist and a lesbian, so some of that stuck. It was interesting to finally meet her. Oh, that's who you are. Some therapists now consider advanced anorexia to be a psychotic disorder, which confirmed Noxon's suspicion that anorexics don't want to be in this world. That was my feeling, too. For me. The interesting thing about anorexia is that you show your wound. There's no hiding it. So my anger and sense of disappointment, all the stuff I was out of touch with, became this visible rebuke to my parents. Just to look at me was a fuck you. She envies friends who grew up in families with a better handle on self-expression and anger, like her sister-in-law. Genji and her mom just scream at each other, and somehow the world doesn't implode. After Noxon started to put weight on, the underlying problems remained. In college I began to function and learn and enrich myself. But I still had this whole secret life, she says. My last year, I tried alcohol. For me it was like, Noxon claps her hands, why in the world would you starve yourself? When you can do this instead. Anorexia is not fun at parties. This reminds me of Jill Soloway's top ethic patriarchy speech at last year's Emmy Awards. I definitely see a new wave of empowered women right now, Noxon says approvingly, and she is ready to embrace it. It's partly getting older, but for the first time in my life I feel just enough franchise, just enough room in the world, to say, take me as I am, or don't take me.